church is being planted and being strengthened by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Today we'll look at a topic that you're all familiar with. And it's kind of, kind of we sometimes, personally, I, speaking for myself, we breathe through it. That the church in Ephesians chapter 6 is, de is described as a soldier of Jesus Christ. As you know, the letter of Ephesians is a deep, deep spiritual letter full of deep truth and full of deep doctrine. Ephesians is considered to be the central spiritual bank of the believer. Paul being uh, a very, uh, I love the style of Paul. He always starts his letters, as you know, by introducing doctrine. So the first three chapters of Ephesians is all doctrine. It's all about teaching, about truth of God. And it's so deep. Ephesians, I mean, just one verse to give you an example. Chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. How many spiritual blessings we have? It will take us eternity to number each one. It will take us eternity to understand the truth of the, what's unfolding before our eyes in the letter of Ephesians. The key word is in Christ. Seated in Christ. In the hand, being blessed in Christ. Chosen in Christ. And so chapter 1 described the church as the body of Christ. Look with me at the last two verses of chapter 1. It says in verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head, that's Christ, the head of the church, over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. So chapter 1, the, you can title the chapter as the body of Christ. Chapter 2, we see the description of the church as the temple. Again, if you look at the last few verses of chapter 2. Verse 21, it says, In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are all being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Go we'll move on to chapter 3. The church is a mystery. A mystery that has been hidden from the Old Testament saints. The prophets of the Old Testament, when they prophesied and they looked in the future, they never saw something called the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Look with me, verse 3. It says, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. This is the mystery of church, as I have briefly written already. And what is that mystery, really? It comes down to verse 6. It says that the Gentiles, that's you and me, non-Jews, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. No more distinction between Gentiles and Jews. We're all one in Christ, free or slaves, male or female, black or white, Lebanese or non-Lebanese. <laughs> we all are one in Christ. That's the love of Christ. For God so loved the whole world, he died for all. So, the first three chapters describe our position in Christ. Then comes the practical aspect of this letter. And Paul uses his infamous word. Starting with chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, it's always in the light of the truth that the Holy Spirit has unfolded for us. Let us now put things in practicality. Let us walk. In verse chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the, of the Lord, beseech you to walk. Encouraging us to walk worthy of that calling. Who we are in Christ. The calling which we were called. So, now, starting chapter 3 and for chapter 4. and chapter, I mean, 4, 5, 6. 
the practical part of the letter, we see our condition in Christ. In chapter 4, it describes the church as the new man. We have a new calling. And we have a new walk. We used to walk as in verse 17 of chapter 4. It says, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walked. In the fulfill, futility of their mind. But then it's, it goes on in verse 22 that we should take out, we should, uh, uh, it says, put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. And then in verse 23, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and then put on the new man. So the church is the new man, chapter 4. Chapter 5, we have another ministry that's also unfolding before our eyes. The church, the bride of Christ. And we see in chapter uh, 5 that last few verses describing marriage. That holy covenant that God has established. Why did God establish this holy covenant between one man and one woman? Well, we see that unfolding also before our eyes in chapter 5. And it starts in... In verse 22, our favorite verse for us men, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And we love to stop there. And then describe that the husband is the head of the wife and also Christ is the head of the church. But then we have a firm command by our God to the husbands. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So we are equal before the Lord. But God has designated leadership of the marriage to one. That's the man. Yes, we are the head, but guess what? Our wives are the neck. They turn us around. <laughs> and so in every kind of organization, there's always one head, not two heads. And we are an equal footing before God. Husbands ought to love their wives, and this is how the wives naturally submit to the love of their husbands. And it goes on in verse 28. I'm skipping verses just to come up to the, uh, the fact that this is reflection of Christ and the church. Look, verse 28, so husbands ought to love their wife, own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh but nourishes it. And cherishes it, church, cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, here we have a quote from the Old Testament. The establishment of the marriage. It was a mystery. Why? And so verse 31 it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined his wife. And they shall be two. The two shall become one flesh. Verse 32 says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. It was reflecting that holy bond between Christ and the church. You see why the marriage is sacred before God? It represents Christ and the church. So chapter 5 describes the church as the bride of Christ. Chapter 6 describes the church as a soldier. And so this morning we'll look at the chapter 6. And we're going to look at the first 19 verses. There's a lot in this chapter. So by God's grace we'll try our best to cover as much as possible. Um, and look at the first few verses that talks about. Children, it says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. As I mentioned, this is talking about, and we'll see more of it, when it talks about the armor of God, that the church is a soldier illustrated in chapter 5. And as you know, when a soldiers go to a boot camp, the first thing they teach them is obedience. 
complete obedience, they have to obey the command. They have to obey the order they receive. In fact, they tell you that in the boot camp, a soldier's kind of, they kind of take all his thinking, his philosophy, his beliefs, kind of scramble it and rebuild all of that. So to do one thing, mentally speaking, to obey. And for us Christians, obedience starts in the family, starts with the children. It says, children, obey your parents in verse, uh, verse 1. For this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is first the first commandment of, uh, with promise, that he may be well with you, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And so, remember, this is talking to Christians, talking to the church. Uh, we uh, teach our children to be obedient, to be respectful to their parents. And you know, one of the first signs that uh, shows the breaking of the family, as the scriptures describe to us, the signs of the last days, is that children disobey their parents. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, it says, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And we don't have to, I don't have to tell you what's going on in our society to, today. One of the signs of the last days is this breaking of the family and children disobeying their parents. So the training of the soldier starts at home, learn obedience at home to, to the parents, and then it goes to the world. So now you grow up, now you are in the world, now you're working, and now you are reporting to your superior. And so verse five, we learn Obedience to the master, obedience to your superiors. It says in verse 5, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And so, you know, we all are work. We either are employees or employers. Either one, we have to go and do our work to please not only our superiors, but to please him who? Christ. That's the ultimate. I happen to play both roles. I am an employee. I work full time, I report to my manager. But also as a director of a ministry, I supervise 15 people. Sometimes it swells up to 20 people. And so I see the two, and both of them, I have to keep in mind that whatever we're doing, we ought to ultimately please do the work unto our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes your manager either break you or make you. I know I've been in the workforce for more than 30 years and I have had managers who helped me to blossom because they were good. But I had managers I could not stand. I could not, cannot understand their decisions. Their decisions were not, I mean, I don't want to say the word here, but stupid. But anyway, <laughs> um, we ought to obey whatever they tell us to do as unto Christ. So obedience starts from home, goes to the world, to be obedient to your masters. This is a sign, these are hallmark of a soldier, of a good soldier. Now come the indoctrination of the soldier. And the soldier, first thing that he has to understand is his own strength. And so in verse 10, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong. 
Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And so we draw our strength as believers from the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. His power has broken the power of the devil, of the enemy. Now, in, he, in, uh, in John chapter 13, it says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. In, second, in Hebrews chapter 2, it says that he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. So Christ's power, we know, that destroyed uh, the power and the work of Satan, the enemy. We are at war with a defeated enemy. The war has been won on the cross. But we have a spiritual battle until he comes and takes us home. And that battle is well outlined for us in this chapter, chapter 6. So be strong. Draw your strength from the Lord Jesus Christ. Not from your own strength. Knowing that he has defeated the power of the devil. Know your strength as one outline. And now next it says we need to know our enemy. And this is in verse 11, verse 12. We have an enemy. And this chapter goes into quite a bit describing who that enemy is. It says put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness, of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have an enemy. We know who that enemy is. First Peter chapter 5 tells us who that enemy is. Verse 8, it says, Be sober, 1 Peter chapter 5. Be vigilant, because what? The, your adversary, the devil. Here it is. It's labeled, who is your enemy? Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may de devour. And so, we have... Uh, an enemy that we have to stand against the wiles of the devil. And this is why the scriptures outline the battle for us, outlines who that enemy. It says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his what? Devices, of his schemes. Satan is a powerful entity. He's the Karub. He's that archangel. He was an archangel. He was perfect in beauty, perfect in strength, perfect in wisdom. It says Ezekiel 28. But it says iniquity was found in him. And read it in Isaiah 14. How it started. It was pride that entered his heart. He wanted to be like the Most High. But God had to cast him out. And one third of the angels were dragged with his fall. So we have Satan, this powerful being, this smart being who has plenty of experience. He's been around for thousands of years, who knows the word of God, opposing you and I, opposing the church, opposing the word of God. And that's what this chapter is all about. You are a Christian soldier. You like it or not, the minute you were born again, the minute you gave your life to Christ, you were enlisted in the army of God. And we have a spiritual battle that the world cannot and will not understand. So, we have an enemy called the devil. And this enemy is battling us in three fronts. Number one... The first front is in the world. 
I mean, this world, brethren, is becoming more evil on a daily basis. I don't have to tell you about it, but you can follow the news and see what's going on in this world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Satan is the leader of this world, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, Whose minds the God of his, this age has blinded. The leader of this age has blinded. This is what Satan is doing. Commanding, influencing the world. So, they, so who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So Satan's front, battlefront, is first of all in the world, and he's swaying the world under his control. And this world is, of course, tempting us. This world is providing everything for believer to enjoy sin. And sin is ensnaring us. It's all around us. And this old nature, this is the second front, enjoys sin. And so we have that struggle. Read it in Galatians chapter 5. It says the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And the two are in opposition. There is a war in us between that old nature and the new man. And the world is just feeding. Satan is just feeding through the world that desire of sin that we are struggling with on a daily basis. Then the third front is the devil himself. And look at how structured, how well organized this devil. The host that he leads. And as the scripture says, we are not ignorant of his schemes. We are not ignorant of his crafty methods. We are not ignorant of his cunning and deception. I can name for you a few of his schemes. And there's quite a bit in the Bible if you do a study what Satan does. That's his full-time job. To, ro to roam around like a lion. He instigates false doctrine. Read 1 Timothy chapter 4. He hinders the works of God's servants. We see that quite a bit in the mission field. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2. It says that evil man, evil man, Satan just influenced evil man to oppose the servants of Christ. He blinds men to the truth. He accuses Christians before God. Look what Satan did concerning Job. Read Job chapter 1. He resists the prayers of God's servants. Read Daniel and see that spiritual uh, conflict that was taking place. That Daniel prayed and took 21 days before the angel came to give him the answer of his prayer. And then the angel told him, Satan was resisting me. And who came to his help? I mean, there's a spiritual battle taking place in the heavenly places. The archangel Michael took, came for his help. He tempts, he afflicts, he deceives, he undermines the sanity of the home. This is some of his schemes. And then we have this description that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now remember, our weapons are not according to the flesh. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, 4, 4 and 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalt itself against. We're not here to battle this world, physically speaking. I know when uh, I, I got saved, you know, I was a teenager, we were all fired up. And I remember one of the friends that I hanged around, he was so fired up, he went to the Catholic Church and destroyed the statues of Mary and the saints. He was all fired up. Zealot 
for God's holiness. But that's the wrong battle. That's not what God commanded us to do. Our battle is spiritual, not physical. So, you know, we're not here to go and yell at people who disagree with us or fight with them. And look at this again, once again, look at the uh, structure and the uh, organization behind Satan. We do not wrestle, verse 12, against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And here, these principalities, according to one commentator, says that these principalities are the demons, those fallen angels, who desire, who, who oversight the nations. You know, uh, as Daniel mentioned in his letter, it was, there are, Satan put these, tried to oversight uh, uh, nations. And I cannot help to see what's going on to our nation. And the struggle, the spiritual struggle taking place way above us that we cannot comprehend. In the Middle East, there are evil power playing in the heavenly places. And all what we can do is put on the armor of God and stand firm in prayer. This is what we'll be leading to in this chapter. So we have principalities. Then we have powers. According to, again, these Commentator says these powers are the privates. These are demons who would love to possess human beings. You may not see it around you here in New Hampshire, but of, you know when we read the gospel, we see quite a bit of that. People being possessed by evil uh, spirits, by demons. If you perhaps travel to countries where they entertain the worship of idols, they uh, love to do magic. You'll see quite a bit scary people who really feel the, the evil that's controlling them. Then we have these rulers of darkness of this world. And these are demons who are in charge of Satan's worldly business. Can't help but think when I read this part about the, what took place in the Olympics. If you remember the mockery they did concerning the uh, Last Supper. And not only that, I think, I can't remember what they did at the very end of the Olymp Olympics. Something mocking Christianity. That's the world, brethren, that Satan is waging war against his church, the Bride of Christ, against the, the body of Christ, against you, and I. Then we have the spiritual wickedness in high places. These are the demons who are in charge of establishing false religions. And we have many of them. The sad part is their favorite places is our, are in seminaries. Yeah. Every strange doctrine comes out of seminary. We don't find two good seminaries these days. Many of them went liberal. Many of them are attacking the truthfulness of our scriptures. Many are attacking the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Many of them are attacking the nature of our God, the triune nature of our God. Who's behind it? Spiritual wickedness in high places. Know your enemy. It says, next, part of the indoctrination as, as soldiers of Christ is to know our commands. We have two commands, and the two come together. Let's read them. Verse 11, the first command, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So putting on the armor of God, the second one is stand. We see that again, verse 13. It said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Second time, the word stand comes. Now, verse 14, stand therefore. 
Two commands. For you as a Christian, for us as soldiers of Jesus Christ, we are commanded to stand firm. We're not commanded in our wrestling with the enemy to attack. The world is attacking. The flesh is attacking. The devil is attacking. But you, are not, you and I are commanded to stand and stand firm. By putting on the full armor of God. And when we stand firm, when we resist the devil, what happens? According to James chapter 4 verse 7, it says resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. We stand. We resist. We put on the full armor of God. Next, part of your indoctrination, you ought to know your armor. Let's look at that. So I'm going to quickly go through the different pieces of the armor. And Paul uses the analogy of a Roman soldier. And so we find, starting in um, verse 14... We find the first part, the first uh, part of that armor. It says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the first piece of the armor is the belt of the truth. Having girded your waist with the truth, having put on. And this is the truth, as we know, is the word of God. That's what the belt, what holds everything, what holds the armor. And reality is, we ought to be, our mind ought to be filled with the truth of the word of God. This is why in, in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 it says, Let the word of God what dwell in you richly. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let your whole being, all what you think about, is the truth of the Word of God. Otherwise, look what will happen. According to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. The minute we forsake our, uh, our fellowship with God, our fellowship with His precious Word, our fellowship in, in, in desiring the Word of God, the, this life affairs, this demand of life just invade us. It says that He may please Him who enlisted Him as a soldier. You are a soldier and you ought to please your Lord. And you ought to think of, your, of everything concerning your Lord. And there's no better than filling your mind with his precious word of God. Gird your, it says, your waist with the truth. With the truth of the word of God. Number two. We have the second part as the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects your heart. And so it says the breastplate of righteousness and we know you and I are not righteous in our own, of course. But Christ's righteousness was imputed to us. We stand righteous before our God because of Christ. God look at you and me through Christ. And he sees us to be righteous. And we ought to preserve that holy bond we have with our God. May we not... Be soldiers in his army if our hearts condemn us of sin that we harbor in our hearts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, Therefore, verse 1, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Preserve that righteous heart that God has created in us and so the breastplate of righteousness is piece number two piece number three is 
uh, verse 15, having shut your feet was the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I call those the shoes of peace. You know, <clears throat> the boots of the soldier is what gives them firm standing. It's what gives them firm foundation. And you and I have firm foundation because of the peace that we, peace with, that we have with God. We were at enmity. We were enemies of God before we got saved. Now we are in this peace that surpasses all understanding. Part of my testimony, when I was a teenager, some of you probably have not heard that, I was a Christian fighter at the age of 14, fighting Muslims in Beirut, Lebanon. When the Lord met me in one of the deadliest battles that I faced, and I knew death was imminent to me. And I remember that I used to describe an enemy. I had an enemy I was fighting. But after I got saved, I realized, you know who I was against? Against God. And God just extended his hand. And this is why we have peace in him. So we, we have boots for peace. Could be peace that we are enjoying because we have reconciled with God, but yet in the same time, we are preachers of the peace of the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of them who spread the good news. So as we go and share the gospel, we spread the good news. And therefore, you and I have a ministry called the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Reconciling people to God. They are at enmity with God. And the gospel, if they accept the Lord, believe in the gospel, they become uh, in peace with God. So this, the third armor, piece of the armor, is the shoes of peace. And now we have the fourth one, which is the shield of faith. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked one. In those days, the shield, you've probably seen them in movies, were uh, as big as a soldier, as tall as a soldier covering his front. And in, in this verse, it says that we have to take that shield of faith, we'll look more into it, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, of Satan. And Satan is good at shooting at us these fiery darts. And Satan is an expert in inflicting doubts at us. And so we ought to stand firm, taking on the shield of faith. And what is faith? Well, in Hebrews, Chapter 11, verse 6, we have a definition, beautiful definition of faith. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe in he, that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And you know, faith is what, what distinguishes our Christianity, biblical Christianity, from all other worldly religion. Because all other worldly religion is built upon faith and works. It's always works have to play a role in attaining and gaining the favor of God. I say that to, you know, when we witness to Muslims. I say, you know, the difference between you and I is we have faith. We operate completely by faith. We believe in the Bible, no matter what you, how you attack it, we believe in every word of God. We believe who God is. We believe in His triune nature. We believe in the divinity of Christ. By faith, we accept all these truths. And by faith, we've been saved. And to them, says, you, you guys are not logical. I said, exactly. We operate by faith. Your God is not logical. How can you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit? That's like three gods. I say, well... No, it's one God, but in three persons. But it doesn't, that's not logical. Well, because God is, Brother Brian, when he prayed, our God is 
above what you and I can think of. And that proves the mightiness and the greatness of our God. No one can understand the nature of God, but by faith we accept who He is. And so we, Satan, tries to doubt everything that we stand upon. The validity of the Word of God. The, the precious doctrine that we hold upon, we build upon. Who Christ is. And so by faith we accept Him. This is why we ought to take on the shield of faith to deflect Satan's attack. Number, number five of the armor of God. The helmet of salvation. What does the helmet protect? Your precious brain. It's interesting. It says helmet of salvation. Verse 17. Um, I'm trying to find my verse. <clears throat> and take the helmet of salvation. Part A of verse 17. You know... One of the things that Satan loves to attack is our assurance uh, in salvation that you are saved. Because there's a huge teaching now that you can lose your salvation. I know when I was a young believer, I remember asking the Lord in my life like five, six times that first year. Why? Because I thought, man, did I lose my salvation? I just sinned. Well, the scripture is clear. Once you are saved, you are saved. We are secure in our salvation. And no one can snatch you from the hands of God. John chapter 10, verse 28. This is what the Lord says. And I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Read Romans chapter 8. Who can separate us from the love of God? No one. We are eternally secure in his salvation. And Satan tries to shoot at us our, our logic to doubt our salvation. So put on the helmet of salvation. Number six. This is the most powerful piece of our armor is the sword and it says the sword of the spirit and it continues to tell us what is that sword of the spirit which is the word of God I sometimes enjoy joking with believers but I like to kind of challenge them if you don't know your Bible you're in big trouble if you don't know at least the question I ask them, how many books in the Bible do you have? If they don't know that, you're in big trouble. Part of the training of a soldier is to take apart that machine gun he has, blindfolded. Why? Because if he's fighting at night and something happened to his machine gun, he has to take it apart. Darkness. So he can clean it or whatever, put it back together. We ought to know the Word of God. We ought at least to have a good understanding where to find certain things. We ought to dwell in the Word of God. These days, because of the business of, business of, the li of life, we're like, the world just kind of sucking us into keep busy and busy and busy. I know I get up in the morning, I'm so blessed to hear my wife listening to the Word of God on, on her app. And I'm here just on the run, flying out of the house, you know, driving fast to, to get to work. Trying to steal some time to pray and read. We call them pop, popcorn prayer, you know, small prayer here, small prayer there. Hold the sword of the Word of God. Know your, the Word of God. For the Word of God is living. For the Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is this discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is dynamic. It's interesting how many times sometimes you read the same chapter or the same verse. And how many times that's, that verse that you read many times speaks to you differently. It's living. It is dynamic. You cannot fight the enemy without the word of God. 
we have a perfect example, our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in Matthew chapter 4, when the Lord was tempted, do you know what the Lord did? He quoted scriptures, one after one. It is written, three times he quoted the scriptures. The psalmist said, I have hidden thy word in my heart, so I will not sin against thee. This is the complete armor of God. This is the perfect armor of God. It's made up of six pieces. But may I submit to you the following. The perfect, the, the complete, the completeness number in the scripture is seven. But here we have six. Where is number seven? Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We've been describing the armor of God that's protecting you all the front. Nothing's protecting you from the back. For two reasons. One is we don't, we don't go backwards. We're victorious in Christ. We're always going standing still. But number two, in verse 13... I'm submitting that to you. I'm not saying this is it. I'm not interpreting. I'm just encouraging. Verse 13 to verse 15. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has complained against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. May I submit to you that the seventh piece, piece is love. Love of the brethren. As I mentioned, we're well protected front, but your back is covered by fellow soldiers, by believers. And this is why we ought to bear one another. There will be frictions, there will be problems, there will be issues, but our example is Jesus Christ who forgave you. We ought to forgive one another. We are to love one another. Do you know that the army of God has the most friendly fire inflictions? Do you know how many churches I attended? I attended six churches in my life and three of them don't exist. You know why? It all starts with one brother. Who wants, who thinks that he knows it all. Usually, he thinks the whole ministry is all around but because of him. And so he started gossiping. He started, you know, just stirring people against each other. And then divisions happen. I am for Paul. I am for Apollos. And we start acting as children. And many churches divide and disintegrate because of brethren not loving one another. We're doing Satan a favor. Our Christian army is not defeated because of him. It's defeated because of us. Love one another. Bear one another. If you think you know it all, well, be careful, my brother, because it says, for submit yourself under the hand of God, and he will uplift you. If you resist, if your pride is lifting you up, God's hand will be upon you. <laughs> And I've seen that time and time again. Someone who thinks he is all everything in the ministry. Love, the seventh uh, piece of the armor. Now, know your strategy. We know that strategy, and I'll quickly finish here in verse 18. That strategy is simple. That strategy is prayer. Verse 18 it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And so we have the strategy of prayer. It's very, very simple, but look how intense this, this, um, this verse is all about. It's all it says, um, we see in this verse, 
it focuses on the variety. It says all prayer and supplication. It says uh, the frequency. When is the frequency of that prayer? Is always. <clears throat> always. <clears throat> Excuse me. Focuses on the submission in the spirit, on the manner being watchful, on the persistence, all perseverance. On the objects, you pray for all, all the saints. And finally, it focuses on the gospel. Read with me verse 19. <clears throat> and he said, For me, that utterance may be given to me, that it may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You know, Paul, when he wrote the letter of Ephesians, he was in jail. Paul didn't come across like, Whoa, unto me, look at me, poor missionary, I am in jail. Well, Look at my shackles. They beat me yesterday. I'm without food, you know. I love those newsletters. It's all about the missionary and how sad he is. No, Paul was a man of God. He always thought about the gospel. Pray for the utterance may be given to me. Strategy, prayer. The church, the soldier of Christ. Your training to be obedient to his command. Your, your indoctrination to know, know your strength, know your enemy, know your commands, know your armor. And that armor is all about Christ. It's all about Christ, the righteousness of Christ, the peace of Christ, the faith we have in Christ, salvation we have in Christ, the word of God. So that we can stand against this formidable enemy and we can survive as a church as a body of Christ today before this evil world that's been that's been moved by this enemy of ours called Satan may the Lord help us may the Lord strengthen us may the Lord give us all desire to be his good soldier in today's uh, today's uh, time that we live in amen well, let's pray and close in prayer. <clears throat> and Father God, we praise you and thank you, Father, for your precious word to us this morning. We thank you, Father, that you didn't leave us alone, orphans, but you gave us your Holy Spirit. You gave us instructions. We gave us your precious word. We thank you, Lord, that even in the battle that we are facing, You've given us everything to stand and to advance for the sake of the gospel. Blessed be your name, O oh Lord. We pray that you help each one of us here and help our hearts to be always anchored to your precious word. May you be glorified. May you be blessed. And we commit to you, Lord, the rest of this time. Commit to your minds and hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.